Now that we've understood the entire data science life cycle, let us actually look at some interesting tasks of data science or data mining. So let's start off by understanding anomaly detection. So as it is stated over here, anomaly detection is just identification of unusual patterns or outliers in the data which we have. So normally, whenever, so this uh, anomaly detection actually comes under the data pre-processing stage. So here, whenever we have data, there could be a lot of chances where we have incorrect data or we have missing data. Or let's say if you have a tabular column, there could be scenarios where the names of the columns are wrong. Or maybe different data has been listed under different columns. So let's say you have the age column and the name column. But what happens is the names are listed under the age column and the age is listed under the name column. So you might have all of these different problems and this is where you would have to you know, take the help of anomaly detection. So the best example of anomaly detection is this. So let's say you have this fancy bar in a city and um, the average salary in general of people who go to that particular bar is let's say around hundred thousand dollars but one fine day suddenly Jeff Bezos decides to go to that bar so on that particular day when Jeff Bezos visits that bar the average salary of everyone who goes to that bar increases significantly so initially the average salary was only hundred thousand dollars but when Jeff Bezos goes to that bar the average salary it let's say becomes one million dollars but the problem is this is actually wrong the result which you get an average salary of one million dollars for that particular day is not one million dollars it is actually hundred thousand dollars but you get this result because over here you have an anomaly who is Jeff Bezos. So Jeff Bezos is the anomaly over here because he, the data is screwed when he comes into the picture. So these are some of the data points which you'd have to consider. So you will have data points at extremities and you can't allow the data points at extremities to influence your whole data. So consider this, let's say if you have 10 data points and out of these 10 data points, 8 of these, their values lie between, let's say, 4 and 6. But the two extremities, you have only two points whose value is equal to 20. So 8 of your data points lie between 4 and 6. You have only two data points which are exactly equal to 20. So over here, because of these two data points, your entire average is skewed to a higher value. So that is why you would have to take care of all of your anomalies. Then we have another data mining task or data science task, which is association rule mining. And this is used to find interesting association amongst different entities. So a perfect example for this is the beer diaper syndrome. So long ago, maybe around um, 10 or 15 years back, there was this case study done by a supermarket where they wanted to find out the relationship between the buying patterns of different customers. And when they were doing this case study, they somehow understood that when a single dad comes into the store or maybe when a dad comes into the store to buy diapers, there is a very good likelihood that he will also buy a can of beers or a bottle of beers along with the diaper. So this is a very uncanny relationship, isn't it? So someone coming into the store to buy a diaper for his child buys a can of beers along with the diaper. So this is an interesting relationship which you will normally wouldn't be able to find without the help of data science. 
So over here, this super mart has used some association rule mining techniques. So they wanted to understand the association between buying different items. And with the help of this, they understood that if a dad comes to the store to buy a diaper, then there is a very good likelihood that he will also buy a can of beers along with it. So this is what is normally used in upselling or cross selling items. So if you go to a store, you would see that, let's say all of the candies are arranged at a single space. All of the medicines are arranged at a single space. All of the groceries are arranged at a single space. All of the stationary items are arranged at a single space. So why is it done? You know, it is not only to make the store look fancy. It is because let's say if you buy a packet of bread and if you also have a milk bottle beside the bread packet, you are more likely to pick up the milk bottle along with the bread packet. Similarly, let's say if you go to the stationary side section, then if you buy a long notebook, there is a very good chance that you might also buy a pen along with the notebook. So this is how stores use association rule mining to upsell or cross sell items. So now that all of this is clear, let's head on to the most important part in the data science life cycle, which is machine learning. So to understand machine learning, let's go through this simple example over here. So what do you actually see in this slide? What is this? This is a fish, isn't it? And what about this? Well, this again is a fish. And this, well, this too is a fish. Now, my question to you folks is, how do you know all of these are fish? Well, as a child or when you are in kindergarten, you would have been told by your kindergarten teachers or your parents that this is a fish. You would have been shown an image of a fish, a picture of a fish, or you yourself maybe had an aquarium at home and you would have been told by your parents that this is a fish and your brain learned that this is a fish and that is how our brain functions. So now let's say you grew up and whenever you again see a real life fish or an image of a fish, your brain automatically registers this entity or this object as a fish and you immediately know that this is a fish. But my question is, if I feed these images of a fish to a computer or a machine, how will it know that this is actually a fish? So we'll apply the same thing as we had done with our brain. So our brain was fed information. It was recurring information. So we were told as a child, you know, we were shown this picture of a fish and we were told again and again that this was a fish and our brain processed it. So our brain first looking at the picture of the fish, it processed all of the features of the fish and then it also associated this tag. So the tag was F-I-S-H along with this object of fish. So we'll do the same thing over here. What we are going to do over here is we will be feeding thousands or maybe even lakhs of images of this fish to this machine until it learns all of the features associated with these. So we are training this machine to learn that a fish will have fins. A fish will have two eyes. A fish normally, you know, it has an oval shape. It has a tail. Uh, fish normally is found in water. So these are all of the features which are fed to the machine. And this phase is known as the training phase. And once the training is done, we will give it a new image or we will give it test data to determine how much it has learned. So here we are giving this machine new data or test data. And if it is correctly able to tag it as a fish, then it would mean that the training is successful. So this is the underlying concept of machine learning. So what we do is 
in the training phase we train the machine with all of the data so that it learns the features associated with the data and once it learns all of the features associated with the data we will give it a new data or test data to determine how much it has learned so that was a brief about machine learning so now that is clear let's look at the different categories of machine learning so machine learning can be broadly categorized into supervised learning and unsupervised learning. We also have another category called as reinforcement learning, which we'll be skipping for now. So you can consider the main categories are supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So we will start off with the first category, which is supervised learning. So in supervised learning, we will have an input variable and an output variable. The input variable is denoted with X and the output variable is denoted with Y and we try to determine how does Y vary with X or how is Y dependent on X. So this what you see over here Y is equal to function of X. This basically means that X is your independent variable and Y is your dependent variable. So the names are very intuitive, isn't it? We call X as the independent variable because this is what influences Y. And since Y is dependent on X, we call this as the dependent variable. So this in supervised learning, just understand that you will have an input variable and an output variable. The input variable is known as the independent variable and the output variable is known as the dependent variable. So now that that is clear, supervised learning can again be classified into two parts. You will have regression and classification. So let's start off with this category, which is classification. So classification is a supervised learning category. And with the help of classification, we try to predict the class of a new variable. So here we have this example. We are trying to predict or classify if someone has cancer on the basis of whether this person smokes or not. So here smoking will be your independent variable and having cancer will be your dependent variable. So on the basis of whether the person smokes or not, we will classify this patient as having cancer or not. So here also when it comes to classification, you would have to remember that your dependent variable is categorical in nature. So when I say the variable is categorical in nature, what I mean is you will have different categories. So either this could be a binary classification or it could be a multi-layered classification. So here what we are doing is just a simple binary classification. So in binary classification, you just have yes and no, zero and one. You basically have only two categories, either this or this. So here consider that you have maybe around a list of a thousand patients and you have a column which will tell you whether this person smokes or not. So that column has only two levels, which is yes or no, which is for whether the patient smokes or not. And on the basis of that, you are trying to classify whether this person has cancer or not. So this is an example of cancer or not. So this is an example of classification, which is a supervised learning algorithm. Then going ahead, we will have regression. So regression is used to estimate the relationship between different entities. So since again, this is a supervised learning algorithm, you will again have a dependent variable and the independent variable and will basically try to understand the relationship between the dependent variable and the independent variable. So under regression, we have this technique called as linear regression. And in linear regression, you have to keep in mind that your dependent variable should be a continuous numerical. So this is where you will have the difference between a classification algorithm and the linear regression algorithm. 
So when it came to classification, you will see that your dependent variable is a categorical variable. It is categorical in nature. But when it comes to regression, your dependent variable will be a continuous numerical. So let's take this example to understand linear regression better. So let's say you are doing a case study and a bunch of um, college students where you're trying to understand if there is any relationship between the CGPA of the student and the GRE score of the student. So let's say some of those students of this particular college are um, trying to go for their masters and to um, go for masters you would have to give this exam called as GRE and they would have given the GRE exam maybe in their uh, final semester or uh, pre-final semester. So here you have two variables your Y your dependent variable would be your GRE score and your independent variable would be your CGPA because I am trying to predict the GRE score of the student on the basis of the CGPA. Now, let's say if I have collected all of the data of these students and I have two columns over here, one column will tell me the GRE score of the student and the other column will tell me the CGPA of the student. So what I do is I map the CGPA of the student on the X axis so because it is my independent variable and I map the GRE score of the student on the Y axis because it is my dependent variable. And if I plot all the points, I will get this straight line. So this tells me that there is a linear relationship between the GRE score of the student and the CGPA of the student, which basically means that if the student has higher CGPA, it is more likely that he will also get a high. What I do is I map the CGPA of the student on the X axis. So because it is my independent variable and I map the GRE score of the student on the Y axis because it is my dependent variable. And if I plot all the points, I will get this straight line. So this tells me that there is a linear relationship between the GRE score of the student and the CGPA of the student, which basically means that if the student has higher CGPA, it is more likely that he will also get a high GRE score. So that is something which we will be getting from this graph itself. But what if I change the question? What if I ask you, if the CGPA of the student is 8.3, what will be the GRE score of the student? How will you answer this? So this is where linear regression comes in. So in linear regression, consider this to be your straight fit line. So with the help of the straight fit line, let's say if the CGP of the student is 8.3, let's say 8.3 is somewhere over here. I will draw a straight line from over here to here. I will draw a vertical line like this. And now from this point, I will draw a horizontal line onto the Y axis. So let's say from here to here and the value comes out to be around 312. So this basically means that if the CGP of the student is 8.3, then the GRE score of the student would be somewhere around 312 or in the margin of 310 to 315. So this is something which we can predict using linear regression. So this was all about our uh, supervised learning techniques where we had regression and classification. Then we will go ahead and understand about unsupervised learning. So in unsupervised learning, you will have to understand that you will not have dependent variables or independent variables. You will just have data points without class labels. So you will not have tags associated with your data points over here. So in this particular example, we have all of the data points where we have cars and bicycles together without the labels. Just consider that we have the images of cars and images of bicycles, but we do not have the tag associated with it. So when I say we don't have the tag, so we'll not have a label which will tell you that this is a car or this is a bicycle. 
So now what we will do is we will go ahead and build an unsupervised learning algorithm on top of this data. And when we build this unsupervised learning algorithm on top of this data, this algorithm automatically divides this data into two clusters. The first cluster comprises of all of the cars and the second cluster comprises of all of the bicycles. Now, even though there were no class labels associated, this unsupervised learning algorithm was able to divide this data into two clusters and this was possible because an unsupervised learning algorithm helps you to understand underlying structure of the data. So here you would have to keep two factor similarity and inter cluster stand the underlying structure of the data. So here you would have to keep two things in mind which is intra cluster similarity and inter cluster dissimilarity. So when I say in mind, which is intra cluster similarity and inter cluster dissimilarity. So when I say intra cluster similarity, so if you look at these three data points inside this cluster, you will see that all of these three data points are very similar to each other. Similarly, if you look at this second cluster over here, you will see that all of these three bicycles are very similar to each other. But when I compare the data points of cluster one with cluster two, you will see that both of those data points are very dissimilar. So cars are very dissimilar when you compare them to bicycles. And this is what is known as inter-cluster dissimilarity. So this is how an unsupervised learning algorithm works. Now let's look at some of the most important languages which are used for data science. So the two front runners over here are Python and R languages. So let's start with this language called as R. So R is a language which was developed by statisticians for statisticians. So if you would want to do any sort of statistical analysis, then R should be your go to language. And also this language is cross platform independent. This would mean that irrespective of whatever operating system you have, you can easily run R on that particular system. And then we have Python. So Python is also an extremely versatile language. And this is one of the most popular languages when it comes to data science. And with the help of this, you can implement most of the machine learning algorithms and you can also implement deep learning frameworks over here. And also both of these languages provide a lot of different libraries for your purpose. So they provide more than 10,000 libraries combining. So if you would want to do data manipulation, you will have a library for that. If you would want to do data visualization, you will have a library for that. If you would want to implement ML algorithms, you will have a library for that. So whatever your purpose is, both of these languages would provide a library out of their hat. And also the best part about these two languages is their huge community. So let's say if you're working on a data science project and you're using either Python or R, and if you're stuck somewhere, then you can just tap into the community, ask your doubts, and you will easily be able to clarify or find the solutions for whatever problem you're facing. So let's actually see how can we download R and Python into our systems. So we'll start off with this language called as R. So I'll just write down download R. So here you would see this first link over here, download R 4.0.3 for Windows. So this will take you to this particular site, cran.r-project.org. And since R is cross-platform compatible, you can download it for any operating system you have. And since I have a Windows system, I am downloading R for Windows. So this is the latest version of R 4.0.3 for Windows. And when I click on this link, the download for R will automatically start. Now, after downloading R, I would need an IDE to work with R. 
So this is where I have an ID called as R Studio. So I'll write down download R Studio. Again, you see this first link over here, download R Studio. So this is the site rstudio.com. You will go over here and you have these different versions R Studio Desktop, R Studio Desktop Pro, Server, Server Pro. We just need the R Studio Desktop free version. I will click on download over here. And since I have a Windows system, I'll click on download and the download will automatically start. And since I already have R Studio in my system, I'll just go ahead and cancel this. Now I'll quickly open R Studio and just show you guys how to work with this IDE. So this what you see is the R Studio IDE and you have these four different panes over here. So this window which you see cursor is currently pointing. This is known as the script window where you write all of your script. Then you have the console window where you execute the commands. Then you have these three different tabs over here. You have the environment window where you can see all of the different uh, data which you have currently in your IDE. Then you have history where you can see all of the commands which you have currently executed till now. Then let's say if you'd want to import something, you can just click over here and you can be able to import whatever data set that you currently have. And as I've told you that these uh, languages are in Python, both of them provide numerous libraries. So if you would want to install a library, just click on install over here. Just write down the name of the library which you'd want to install. So let us say if I would want to install the ggplot2 library, I will just write down ggplot2 over here. I will select this and when I click on install, the library will be automatically installed. Then you have this plots option where you can go ahead and create different types of plots. So this is a basic intro to R and R Studio. Now that we've got this, let's see how can we download the next important language for data science, which is Python. So again, for this, what we'll need is we will need a distribution called as Anaconda. Now before that we would have to download Python as well. So just type in download Python over here and you will see this particular link download Python python.org just click over here and this is the home page which you see and this is the latest version of Python 3.9.0 and as I've told you Python is also a cross platform independent language. So you have Python for Windows, Linux and Mac. And since I have a Windows system, I can just click on download Python 3.9.0 and the download will automatically start. And now after installing Python, you can go ahead and download a distribution called as Anaconda. So write down download Anaconda. Now Anaconda is basically a distribution which will provide you all of the toolkits for Python. So here click on products, select the individual edition. Now under individual edition, you will have this. So you see this your data science toolkit. So this is what Anaconda is. Click on download and you will go to the bottom page. So here you have three options. So you can download Anaconda for Windows, Mac and Linux. And since again, I have a Windows system, I can just directly go ahead and download the 64 bit graphical installer and that will automatically install Anaconda into my system. So the advantage of Anaconda is since this is a toolkit, you don't have to individually install the additional libraries which are there in Python. So in Python, you have certain libraries such as matplotlib, pandas and numpy, which are essential for data science. So if you have this Anaconda distribution, these libraries come in pre-installed and you don't have to install them by yourself. Now, this is just the distribution. So this distribution also provides you an IDE called as Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook is a web based IDE. Now, to work with Jupyter Notebook, I'll just show you how it is done. So just type 
anaconda select anaconda prompt over here now let this properly open up over here type in jupiter notebook here you would have to keep in mind that it is y j u p y t e r i've hit enter so i'm just waiting for the jupiter notebook to open up so this is jupiter notebook guys so if you'd want to create a new notebook just click on new select python 3 and over here you have these different cells and this is where you will be running all of your python commands if you'd want to rename your jupyter notebook just select over here just type new jupyter note click on rename and you'll be able to rename this this brings us to the end of this course on data science foundations thank you very much for watching this course